with us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. Always fun to come up here. You say it like you mean it. Well, I'm particularly a big fan of the uh, Friday donuts and pastries. I'll <laughs> <laughs> we'll just be honest. Seeing as it's right? Wednesday. <laughs> Seeing as it's Wednesday. Uh, you missed a reenactment uh, last Friday. There's no floor show this week. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're, we're kind of in tune with that as well, and we'll give you the opportunity to participate if you'd like to bring some. <laughs> Only <laughs> <laughs> uh, if they're cream filled. We are going to say, <laughs> you guys might not be happy <laughs> with what I grab on the way in. <laughs> Give us a chance to be critical. Give <laughs> you a chance, huh? We all go to that gas station. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple of different perspectives from which um, I yeah. think we can. Um, benefit from Damien's wisdom and uh, that is understanding what the state of Vermont has in place for regulation of alcohol um, and then I think the other perspective uh, that we might pick his brain a bit about is um, you know how how did Vermont come out of the prohibition era and into um, a regulated sale of alcohol of course, those parallels won't be direct because we're in a very different time. Um, but I think worthwhile uh, knowing, understanding what that process looked like so that we can think about ways that this may or may not look similar. Yeah, so uh, for the record, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council, before I get into this overview, maybe I'll do a little bit of history on our alcohol laws and, and prohibition. So Vermont actually had prohibition twice, uh, once in the late 19th century and then again uh, when there was national prohibition. Uh, and both times it was not a successful program, uh, as you may know. Um, the initial time uh, prohibition was a statewide law, but uh, let's say the compliance with the law was spotty at best. Uh, and towns essentially set their own policies. Uh, the second time around, um, as you know, national prohibition, uh, again, compliance was spotty um, with lots of corruption and organized crime that grew up around that. Uh, what came out of that was uh, our, our Title VII basically came almost entirely in the structure we've got now, grew out of prohibition. And it was uh, a movement that um, there were kind of two models that came out of it. And one of them was this control state model with the idea that the state uh, could help promote temperance by controlling the supply of alcohol. Uh, so the idea and temperance to to keep in mind here, the original meaning of temperance was sort of moderate consumption, not total prohibition on consumption, although that's where the temperance movement got, was prohibition. Um, so this idea was basically a pushback against that, saying pro a prohibition was a massive failure, so we need to moderate the consumption of alcohol. What's the best way to do that? It's to get the state involved in controlling the supply of hard liquor. And so that's where we came out in 1934 uh, when we passed Act Number 1 of the special session that year, which was to legalize the sale of alcohol in Vermont. So what they created was the Liquor Control Board, uh, which was sort of an island from state government, the idea being that it would be insulated from the political um, temper of the moment because you have people who are appointed and then they appoint the commissioner of liquor control who works for them to control uh, sort of the sale uh, and regulation of alcohol within the state. So you don't have a governor coming in and just putting in a political buddy. Um, and you don't have policy of the department changing with the political times as one party changes over to the other. So the idea was that you get um, some isolation there to get away from some of the corruption that was seen as a potential. 
The other thing um, that came out of it was this idea that the state would have this dual role, the, the Department of Liquor Control and the board would have this dual role of promoting the sale in order to bring an income to the state, but also promoting temperance. So how do you promote the sale and balance that against moderate consumption? And one of the ways the state does that is by controlling the number of outlets uh, and also controlling the price. So the price of any hard liquor you buy in the state right now is at a price set by the, the board of liquor, the liquor control board, which is now the board of liquor and laundry. And I'm going to use those terms interchangeably because I'm still adjusting to the new name. Um, but the, uh, so the, the idea was that they would, they set the price, they control the supply, they control where you can buy it, uh, and uh, since that time, the idea at that time was that this would control it. Since that time, studies have shown that you have lower liquor consumption when you reduce the outlets uh, with, with hard liquor. So that part is at least played out. And then we've also found here in Vermont that it's a significant source of income for the state and it's a reliable one. Um, so uh, the... The other piece that the board controls is, of course, licensing all of the different pieces in here. Now, one of the issues here with marijuana, the parallels that we can't have, is because marijuana is a controlled substance at the federal level, and it's a, it's a prohibited substance, the state ownership of that at some point uh, is potentially problematic, and I would leave let Michelle discuss those issues with you more because she's far more knowledgeable about that. But that's a big difference between alcohol and marijuana. Um, so this control state model doesn't apply as much, but the regulatory model might be something you're interested in. So, And that's something to keep in mind, though, as you're evaluating these, because it's not an apples to apples uh, sort of comparison. Um, there are some significant differences between the substances here. Um, once even even just getting away from uh, the time that they've been used within the um, society and the, the how marijuana is just kind of more recently coming to the legal market versus alcohol having been um, legal in the state for uh, over 90 years now or 80 years um, so 85 there we go um, but anyway, so the Board of Liquor and Lottery is a five-member board. They're appointed by the governor. They serve for three-year terms that are staggered, and you can have no more than two consecutive terms, the idea being that uh, you don't want to have the board become sort of uh, entrenched, sclerotic, uh, non-responsive to things. Um, you want to allow for some fresh faces on the board. Um, the Board of Liquor and Lottery meets one to two times per month. They have jurisdiction over alcohol, tobacco, and the state lottery. So again, versus any sort of control system or, or regulatory body you might envision for marijuana, this is different because they've got a wider jurisdiction. Um, but they do licensing for all uh, stages of alcohol production. Um, and as well as tobacco sales and lottery sales. They adopt the rules necessary to carry out the laws. They enforce those laws. They oversee the opening of state liquor agencies, and they oversee the operation of the state lottery. What I'm going to focus on here for you is just the, the retail sales aspect and the licensing aspect. So the licensing process for retail alcohol sales is interesting in Vermont because it's a local state sort of partnership. So the board will review all the licenses for retail sales, and these are what we call first and second class licenses. To put it more simply, a first class license is a restaurant, a second class license is a retail store. So the Three Penny is a first class license, Yankee Wine and Spirits is a second class license. Um, so before you even get to the board though, you have to apply to the local control commissioners, which is your town select board or your city council, depending on where you live in the state, 
or if you're one of the few Vermonters who lives in a gore, it's the administrator of the gore. Um, so uh, once you get local approval, uh, and they're directed to sort of administer the liquor laws locally, and they can impose conditions based on local ordinances around noise and um, other sorts of nuisances that might crop up. So if there's a, you know, restrictions on noise after a certain hour, they can impose that uh, restriction on the licensees. Um, but after you receive local approval, your application gets forwarded to the board that then reviews the application against the liquor laws as well as looking at corporate documents, trade name, your lease, your rental agreement, or your deed to make sure you have control of the property, um, your rooms and meals tax number, they want to make sure you're actually a legitimate business operating within the constraints of the law. They look for your federal tax number, your lodging number if you're a hotel, your health license if you're operating a restaurant, um, compliance with the training requirements. So you got to train your servers on sales here so that they're um, you know, making sure that they're not serving people who are intoxicated, they're checking IDs, etc. And then they also look to make sure you're actually up to date on your taxes and your unemployment insurance contributions. And then licensing is on an annual basis on April 30th of every year. Um, so that's kind of a summary of the retail process. The process for all the other licenses is just a state process. So if you're a manufacturer, that's just through the state. Uh, if you're a wholesale distributor, that's just through the state. Um, and then if you're getting a license or a permit for, um, for example, a festival or something like that, you may have to get a separate local permit, but you're gonna get your, your permit for the actual service of alcohol through the state. Um, the only exception to this is catering licenses, which have a local state approval uh, aspect. So that's kind of a 30,000 foot view of the process. Um, it might be better if I just start answering sort of specific questions um, that have come up because I don't know where you're at on your consideration of the marijuana bill at this point. Um, so in that context. Jim? So I have a couple questions. First of all, um, I understand the difference between the control state having the state line for spirits and then the regulated state for beer and wine. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that would prevent the state from be, being a controlled state for marijuana if we want to go down that path? Not grow it, maybe, but buy. I mean, we don't grow it. We don't manufacture our own liquor. We buy it from purveyors. So the, the concern that I would have about that yeah. um, is that the Federal Controlled Substances Act prohibits the possession of marijuana. OK. Um, now, that's not currently the enforcement of that is currently sure. kind of on the there's a lot of folks. So but yeah, you put a state in a really weird position there. Got it. Okay, so um, renewing licenses, you mentioned the towns initially uh, grant the license and it goes up to the DLC and then they do their magic and approve the license after that. The retail licenses are renewed first at the town and then at the state level every year. Okay. This has been a that's a, a on what, on sort what of grounds can a town not renew a license? So a town cannot renew a license if you're either out of compliance with the, the liquor law um, or if you violated one of the conditions of your license. So the conditions of your license become, essentially if you're in violation of your license conditions, that could be a reason to suspend or revoke the license. That's, it's a um, state license at that point, or a state. Right. Typically, revocation is something that's handled at the, although the, the law, I believe, allows municipalities to do it, that's typically something that the board does. The municipalities will refer so, it up to the board. And the so board I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there was, evaluates I want to say, a case in Rutland recently where a bar just had a bad record of fights breaking out in town. City said, here's how uh, they didn't read the license. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any instances in retail stores where you're not, you know, it's not on premise consumption that towns have said, 
you know, we don't want to renew your license. I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. Okay. Um, that might be a better question for the department. Um, but I mean, it's conceivable to me that if you had a retail outlet that had had multiple violations for selling to minors or something like that, that the town might decide not to renew the license, um, or that they might have a proceeding before the board for suspension or revocation of their Is license. Multiple, multiple violations spelled out anywhere. I mean, if you so, if you if a store is sold to a minor, mm -hmm. that's a violation of their conditions of a license, but that's one violation. Uh, I wouldn't think most towns would, but could they not renew because there was a violation? Let me pull up the statute for you here, and I'll just bring and, us and, over there. And while you're doing that, mm -hmm. you can multitask. Um, <laughs> to my best. If a town decided, um, for whatever reason, they wanted to become a dry town, mm -hmm. What happens to the existing bars, and restaurants, or stores that are in that town after the town takes a vote? So I think at that I don't know that it's ever happened, but I wonder what would happen. Yeah, I'm not sure that it has. If it did, it was probably closer to the repeal of prohibition, because I think towns have generally been going the other way yeah. um, at this point. But yet you can't get a license if you're in a dry town, so I think at that point their license would lapse when it renewed the term ran out. Okay. Um, but that's an interesting question. I, it's not one I've thought about before. So I'm going to pull up the penalty for uh, sale or furnishing to minors. Um, so <laughs> the uh, so you'll notice here um, what we're looking at is so a person who violates subsection A, which is sell or furnish alcoholic beverages or knowingly enable consumption, is subject to a penalty of $500 to $2,000 in imprisonment for up to two years or both. Um, so it's pretty stiff. And then there is a provision here that for if it occurs during a compliance check, which is when they send in someone underage intentionally, uh, then you're assessed just a civil penalty. And on the second violation, the civil penalty is between 100 and, and 500. Um, and you're only subject to criminal violations within uh, if it occurs within a year of the first violation. Um, and then as far as the license revocation, there, and this is actually up for, um, is, uh, let's see if I can find the right term here. Um, here we go. <clears throat> so, um, so there's a penalty for the person who does the selling which could include a jail term. And then the license here, um, if you're in violation of the title, the conditions pursuant to which was, the license was granted or any rule prescribed um, by the board, uh, they have the power to suspend or revoke. Um, and then revocation, you have to have the hearing before the Board of Liquor and Lottery. So I need to just correct what I said earlier. They need to go to the Board of Liquor and Lottery. Um, but they can be suspended by the municipality. And then there's always the renewal. So you can do the non-renewal at that point. Um, the uh, Typically, I think you have to have multiple violations before they do a revocation, or you have to have a really serious uh, violation, but um, this is something where the department's really the better entity to testify on this. But I think typically the, the groups you see getting a revocation are it's a, a, a licensee that is, you know, they, they got penalized once, they didn't learn their lesson, they got penalized again, and, you know, on the second or third time through the system, the board says, you know, this is enough. Um, Okay, so one last question, and I'll be quiet. Um, there's been some discussion about, uh, you know, keeping it local, um, given 
first shot at you know, local entity, Vermont entities for uh, these licenses. And it seems to me, on the liquor license, it used to be you had to have a majority of your board, if you were a corporation, um, to be Vermont residents. So and then that, I thought that was changed at some point. Yeah, the, the majority of Vermont residents, I think, was probably taken out back in the mid, uh, I'm trying to think, it might have been the mid-2000s when the Grand Home decision came down. So, uh, so one of the things you're dealing with here, again, that, and this is a difference between alcohol and marijuana, is for purposes of alcohol, you're dealing with a substance that's in interstate commerce. Mm -hmm. With marijuana, it's not in legal interstate commerce. There may be marijuana that's transported in violation of federal law interstate, but um, so the restriction to having, allowing just uh, residents to obtain a license um, has run into problems in other states where it, it, they have that restriction. Uh, in fact, there's a Tennessee case that just went up to the Supreme Court where they restrict, they required you to be a resident of the state for a certain period of time before you could get a license. Um, and that case, that law is being challenged and I expect it to be struck down as, viola as a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, the, in Vermont right now, our restriction, I'm just gonna pull this up here. So the definition is person. You have to be a citizen or lawful permanent resident of the United States or have a majority of your owners or members, um, if you're an LLC, be citizens or lawful permanent residents of the United States. And this is actually proposed to change this year uh, that passed the House already and is pending in the Senate to allow individuals who are here on an E-2 and uh, non-immigrant investor visa to be, um, to allow them to get ownership as well. Um, we've, you'll notice that the EB-5 has been kept out because of the problems with that program, but the E-2 is the non-immigrant uh, counterpart to that visa. Um, it requires a smaller investment, but we do have business owners in Vermont who are here on that visa and are operating businesses where they would like to sell alcohol um, that cannot right now because they're either in compliance with the state statute and out of compliance with their immigration requirements or they're in compliance with their visa requirements and out of compliance with the liquor law. Uh, so, but right now you have to be a lawful permanent resident um, or citizen of the US. Thank you. Other questions? Questions. Um, just a, a comment and then a question. Um, so, addressing Jim's things, there's only two grounds that a, a, a select board acting as a liquor control commission can deny a license or suspend a license for. One is what Damien already pointed out, um, but there can be local ordinances um, regulating entertainment or um, right. Public nuisances that they can also deny or suspend a license for. Thank you. And just yeah, and that's one of the things that they can condition that license on too. Yeah. Um, so there, uh, there have been instances in some of the municipalities where that the violation has been a violation of the local ordinance, and then that that's actually there were a couple cases that went to our state supreme court several years back um, that challenged some of the local authority and the local authority was kind of the Supreme Court's mapped it out pretty clearly. Yeah, it's what, pretty restrictive. Yeah, it is pretty restrictive, but there it, it still exists. So so my question is, I mean, you talked about how limiting the number of you know state liquor stores, you know, limits consumption. Mm -hmm. the, the, do you know or, or or where we go to find out how the Board of Liquor and Lottery determines how many stores should be in the state and their geographical uh, diversity, I guess, 
So that's a, a multi-part answer, okay. um, and I can give you, tell you what I know about it, um, and then of course the board or the commissioners uh, can always fill in additional details. Um, the so they they look at things like um, population density, mm -hmm. distance to the nearest other uh, liquor agency. Um, so they they don't want to oversaturate any one market. Um, they but they do want to provide people reasonable access, and they also want to do it in a way that's going to, you know, be uh, generate a reasonable return for the state. Um, since the state owns the, the liquor on the shelves, the person who operates the location is just the agent for the state, and they get a sales commission. Um, so they, they look at things like that. So that's why you might see... For example, I think Burlington has four liquor agencies, but other towns may not have one and they have to go to the neighboring town for a liquor agency. And it's based a little bit on population density and then trying to make sure no one has to drive beyond a certain amount of time to get to one. The other limiter for the department and the board right now is the warehouse and the IT system. Uh -huh. So we are currently at 80 agencies, and my understanding is that until we get a newer, more modern warehouse with a modern IT system, we cannot expand beyond the age of 80 because we're both at capacity for warehouse space, and we're also at capacity for what the IT system can handle as far as processing shipments and, and so forth. So we're they are, that is why they are currently working through the capital bill to try to get uh, a new warehouse and headquarters put together um, so that they can modernize that. If you've seen the liquor warehouse, um, it is, uh, it's amazing what the department does with what they have. It's a very antiquated building. It's not in great shape. Um, and they have squeezed, as far as I can tell, uh, it seems like they've squeezed every available square inch out of that building. Um, a few years back when the, uh, I think it was during uh, interim commissioner Giffen's time, it's Representative Gardner, you might have still been with the department then, I can't remember, uh, but they, they had a consultant come in to figure out how to squeeze additional capacity out, mm -hmm. and they were able to stretch the life of the building by a couple more years by rearranging where the racks were and how they arranged inventory. But I mean, it's literally at that point where they're just, they're moving things around, but the, the racking is outdated. Uh, it doesn't, it, it doesn't serve the latest sort of picking equipment. It doesn't serve the latest loading equipment. So it slows down every step of the process um, there. So. The drivers are not able to unload as quickly as they might want to. They're not able to uh, load the trucks as quickly as they would want to. And so it, it's the, that's kind of the bottleneck right now. Um, so I don't know how many agencies they might add if they could. Um, but at, at this point, they, they were at 78 when I started here in 2014. They've gone to 80 in the last few years. And, I don't think they're going to add any more until they get a new space. Hmm. So, it's interesting. JP, Bob, and Jim? Uh, I, I got the answer. Bob? I think I found it. So that's a good answer to the, the basically box on the end of liquor. When we started the lottery, there was that kind of box too because we didn't want to promote gambling for the book. And then eventually that caveat went to the wind so you can have two sellers right next door to each other uh, as we do in Burlington a lot um, and it, this is the same sort of situation we don't want to really be promoting marijuana use that much is there a reason why lottery control went out the window on that you're only here to 2014, maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Yeah, I don't know the, the history on the changes around lottery, and it's worth noting, too, that this is just for the retail outlets for hard alcohol. Um, you can still get, you could still have multiple restaurants right next door to each other that can sell spirits. That's a, that's a third class license, which mm -hmm. you get in addition to your first class. Uh, but the, um, 
you know, so it, it is just the outlets for taking uh, spirits for consumption off the premises that they've limited. Um, and I don't know the history behind um, the lottery there, and without, I don't know enough about the marijuana bill to know how the provisions in there might match up or not to what's currently on the books. Um, I know that there is, you know, that sort of process of the, the third class licenses for restaurants are more expensive, which limits them to some extent. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's additional liability too, so that does make people choosier. But you can still have, you know, for example, on Church Street in Burlington, you have several uh, outlets at the bottom of Church Street there um, that have a first and a third class license, so or several restaurants, excuse me. Thank you. Jim, and then Hal, and then JP. Would there any? to the back of the regulated market, which is really what this is. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that would prohibit us we want to use beer and wine as a, an example of limiting the number of licenses? Um, I, mean, I, I ask that because, uh, you know, uh, in, in Massachusetts, for example, they used to have a same ownership limit. So it used to be a, you know, you could only own three licenses, and then eventually they changed it. It might be ten now or something, but they limit it. Yeah. Um, I don't know that they limit the location, but maybe they do. Um, could we do something like that uh, if it were liquor? I mean, that beer. Yeah. Wine. So I'm I'm not aware of anything that would prohibit it. And in fact, for fortified wine permits, which is a permit mm -hmm. for yeah. uh, for a a retail outlet to sell right. higher alcohol wine, right. which would normally only be available through a state liquor agency. Uh, those are limited to 150 statewide. So we've done it with respect to that. And then there are limits on the number of sort of short-term um, special event permits that uh, an entity can get per year, depending on the type of permit. Um, so I think right now the, the special event permit, which is actually one of the names of the permits, is list, limited to two a week. And these are sort of for the pop-up of the manufacturer so that they can um, serve their product and sell you bottles of it um, from a location like uh, this is different than like a farmer's market. It's sort of they pop up at another special event um, in a delineated space. I mean, we do um, limit it in terms of medical, yeah. medical right now. Right, so medical marijuana is limited right now. Um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't limit the number. Okay. Um, the one thing that you would probably want to be conscious of is that it's being done on a basis that's not somehow discriminatory. Um, you know, so, uh, or, you know, would have people say, you know, there, there's a, an like equal treatment, treatment right. equal treatment issue or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. so. so in terms of uh, the licensees, um, are the applicants all given equal consideration when applying, or would a corporation be more favorable than an individual because they're more stable? Or well, I think uh, with the licensees, they're all on equal footing when they apply. Um, you know, your the basic is you pay your fee and you submit your application. Um, you, a corporation may have some advantages in being able to draw on greater resources um, in terms of putting its application together and getting the necessary insurance and so forth, but I don't think that they're given any sort of benefit when they're actually being considered. Um, so it's nothing that, you know, an individual who has similar resources um, you know, or a, an LLC that had similar resources would be on exactly the same footing. Um, so I think, you know, it, it, there's nothing there that's not, that is inherent in someone being a corporate entity, um, you know, that couldn't be there for an individual with significant resources if you have a well-resourced corporation. And you know, we also have to remember that a lot of 
sole proprietors form a corporation for uh, liability reasons, um, and they're going to function much the same as an unincorporated sole proprietor uh, in terms of the resources they can bring to bear. So the application process might be difficult for them uh, because they can't hire counsel or a consultant to help them through it, or they you know, don't have those extra resources to, to throw at the issue. Um, but at the same time, when they get in front of the local control board and the liquor control board, as long as their application is thorough and, and checks all the, you know, the requirements and so forth, they should be on equal footing. Okay. JP? <coughs> okay, I want to get away from the liquor and alcohol terms. Okay. This, this part of the question. So. Are there different licenses required to sell, say, whiskey, wine, and beer? Yes. So beer and wine are sold under the same license. Uh, whiskey and other, other hard alcohol uh, requires, if you're going to sell it for consumption off the premises, uh, you need to either be a state liquor agency um, if you're going to sell all kinds of alcohol from 16% and above, um, or if you're just selling wines that are 16% or above, you need to have a fortified wine permit. Uh, but otherwise, beer and wine is the same, is grouped together. For manufacturing, we group things as beer, wine and fortified wine, or spirits and fortified wine. So there's three different manufacturing subsets of the manufacturing license. And so if I wanted to manufacture beer and whiskey, I'd need two separate licenses there. Um, not to mention my federal approvals, which are pretty significant if you're doing spirits. Um, so that that's, does that answer your question? Um, part of it. Okay. There's two parts. <clears throat> and the second part is so, if, and that's why I thought you probably were gonna say. But is that why there's, you guys use two terms, liquor and alcohol? Like, like at the very top of your overview, it says Board of Liquor and Lottery and Alcohol License. So my question is, is that why you use liquor and alcohol? And so just within, um, within my outline, um, if I just go back to that for a second. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's why I went back there. Yes. <laughs> it's fishing for a compliment. Um, so, um, so the Board of Liquor, uh, or just the Liquor Reference Department of Liquor Control, Department of Liquor and Lottery, is to me it's an antiquated term. Uh, when we did the modernization. Uh, we switched almost everything over to alcoholic beverages. Um, and the reason for that is liquor, in most people's minds, uh, refers to higher alcohol um, products. And so it was confusing to people when you'd say Department of Liquor Control, but they also control beer, they control wine, they control industrial alcohol. Um, and scientific alcohol, so your you know, uh, grain alcohols, uh, methanol, that sort of thing that you're not going to be selling for human consumption, um, but you might be using to degrease uh, a machine shop or something like that. Um, they control permits for that as well. Uh, so that was why we've gone over to alcohol licensing. Um, to be more clear about that. So liquor is really just an old-fashioned term that's stuck around because it's been in the title. Um, spirits, we continue to use um, just to refer to the higher alcohol <coughs> beverages, again, to try to get away from any confusion over what liquor is referring to. Um, and so that that's uh, kind of where we're at. But basically the way I think of it is beer and wine and then spirits and fortified wines. Uh, if I'm thinking about it, or hard alcohol and uh, everything else. So, oh, that's good sense. Yeah. It's a great yeah. Thank you. 
questions for Damien? This is excellent. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, please let me know if you have other questions, and I'm happy to. Uh, if you have questions that for Michelle, I'm happy to just provide her with whatever I can. Um, so I hope this was helpful to you. I believe it was. Um, so great. Thank you for your time. Michelle. I don't I was just wondering if um, just based on some of the questions there, if it, if it might be helpful if I just give you a quick just a little reminder overview of what there is for licensing in S54. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's the there's the five types of licenses mm -hmm. under which there can be several tiers within each type of license and that's determined by the board. The bill doesn't set a certain cap on the number of licenses. So previous legislation has said, oh, you, you can have you know, 42 retails, or you can have this or that. It doesn't set that. It's to be determined by the board. Um, uh, one, an applicant can only have, can have no more than one of each type of license. So you couldn't have, so I think somebody was talking about, could somebody have, you know, four different retail outlets? They could not under S54. They would only be able to have one of each. Um, and then the way that it works in terms of uh, the initial application period is the way that it rolls out is that um, they first open the period for application for uh, for cultivators and um, and uh, I think uh, testing labs and um, and then that's a 30 day application period that opens for the initial application period. And then that closes, and the board can open it up in a later time, but the idea was to do a kind of a staggered rollout for the application, starting first with the grow operations and then ending with the last folks with the retailers applying for it. And so, um, uh, so there's not, so they may initially be saying, well, we're just going to take this, whoever applies in this 30-day period and process, and we're going to determine how many, whether we're going to have a cap or not, and then they can open it up later. And with regard to having a lot of uh, stores congregated in one particular location. One of the, if you recall, there was a list of priorities and things that the board is supposed to consider in adopting rules for selection um, of, of applicants. And one of the things that they're to consider is the ge geographic distribution of, of, of the applicants. So the staggered um, uh, licensing plan is in recognition of the fact that once you have cultivators licensed and online, you've got basically eight months before they're going to have a product. Right. What, uh, this is kind of, this was a piece that's been in a number of, 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 of bills for a mm -hmm. few years now, and the, um, we had consulted with Washington State when it had gotten its program off the ground, and, and that was one of the recommendations they made, is they had a problem in that they kind of licensed folks all at the same time and so they had retailers with no product um, and so they said you know kind of start out with your growth facilities getting your product going then the product manufacturers and the testers and the distributors and then your retailers come on last mm -hmm. and that provides it also allows you a way to be able to manage the kind of onslaught of a lot of applications coming in at the beginning and they had also recommended the 30-day window initially because they said you just get kind of crushed at the initial point there. And so it doesn't mean that it, that it doesn't, the window doesn't open later, but this, for the initial offering, you kind of start to roll it out in a, in a manageable way. Mm -hmm. Questions for Michelle? That, uh, that Anything else that you would like to be reminded of with respect to S54? And then also just on the, Damien did touch on it, but about the control model, you know, and we can talk about it later if you, if you want, but um, there's a there's a difference when you're doing the analysis, the constitutional analysis with the, with the Controlled Substances Act between whether or not a state is regulating the market or whether or not they're in possession, actually, and distributing the cannabis. And there's a difference <coughs> in terms of what your risk is with regard to um, that's being concerned about your violation of the Controlled Substances Act. Mm -hmm. yep. So in, in regards to liquor, um, a few years back, Maine, which was very similar to Vermont, is a control state for liquor. They decided they, while they wanted to control it, they outsourced their wholesale distribution. 
as opposed to Vermont. Vermont is the wholesaler experience. Could we select and have a wholesaler to keep the state out of it, but yet we control, you know, one wholesaler for the whole state? I'm just I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I want to go down that path. I'm just asking. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think what I would say is that the, the closer you are to being involved in possession and distribution of a Schedule One drug, rather than regulating other people doing it, you kind of uh, climb the ladder of you know, the, the, well, I get the that. But, concern. But, but we would I, be but regulating it. But if you're regulating, regulating one as opposed to fifty, then maybe maybe just. Um, uh, Whatever. I, I think we just have to explore things to simplify it. And, and again, I'm not a fan of monopolies, but um, maybe, I mean, whatever. It's just sometimes it, these thoughts pop up. And we can kick the tires as many times as you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. All right. So, committee, we have Dr. Levine in the chair. Is anybody dying to go to a drink of water or? stretch or shall we um, take a gamble that we're going to get out of here early by starting early. Thank you so much for your flexibility today. No problem. Welcome to the committee. We are uh, doing our best to work our way through the bill proposals in X54 um, and would love to hear uh, your perspective. I, I suspect that you might make reference to a bill that's currently across the across the hallway there, in terms of um, your view on prevention activities. So, thank you. So, Commissioner Mark Levine, Department of Health. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so, these are links to um, to reports, which I am not going to exhaustively detail <laughs> in my testimony today but you may find them quite useful um, because they're very timely. So the health impact assessment was produced by the Department of Health a couple years ago and subsequently updated. And it and a document from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, really details what is, from an evidence-based standpoint, known or not known about the impacts of cannabis on human beings. And a whole host of health and mental health and um, productivity and life kind of spheres, if you will. Solely focused on cannabis? Yes, okay. Okay. solely focused. And then the Governor's Commission on Marijuana, uh, obviously uh, we had an education and prevention subcommittee, which I chaired. Um, which utilized data from the previous documents I've referred to uh, and came out with a set of recommendations, some of which we'll talk about more here today. Um, and that's fairly brief reading as well. <clears throat> so um, I would start out by saying from a public health standpoint, we already have a public health problem with regard to marijuana use. Uh, and it's particularly focused on the youngest of the Vermonters. Um, the whole reason the governor appointed the commission and the subcommittee was to focus on that population. We have youth risk behavior survey data. That's a survey that's administered uh, to youth every other year and it has an incredibly high uh, response rate. Uh, and we have years of data to compare, so it's a very valid tool. And the most concerning part of the recent data um, was that there was an increase in current use of marijuana among youth in the past two years. We're waiting for the next set of data uh, to see if that truly makes a trend, but the trend had been stable or downward for a long time, and now it's suddenly going upward. When you put that usage rate together with the perception of harm that youth have for the substance, it's very concerning. Our youth are not fools. They know 
two thirds of them say that if they maintained a tobacco smoking habit, that would not be good for their health. When you ask them that about alcohol and cannabis, only in the 30% do they say that that's not necessarily good for their health. And likely even worse with respect to vaping. Yeah, the question wasn't asked because the vaping epidemic is so new. Oh, please it, ask. Yes. I have had to oh, yes. in high school and we've had some yes. conversations about this. Yes. So uh, I suspect, well, we're trying to bend the curve on that one, but I suspect you're right. That the perception of the harm of it would be low. Uh, but it's in the news a lot now. Um, so I'm not going to repeat the whole impact assessment, but I do want to highlight some of the important impacts specifically on youth because these are things that we definitely know. So it can have an adverse impact on academic performance. It can have an adverse impact on long-term IQ potential. There's definitive evidence, and now there's increasing concern and evidence in the literature that the linkage between new, novel use of cannabis, THC, I should say, probably in this regard, uh, and a developing brain and psychosis are quite tightly linked. So uh, not that adults cannot become psychotic, but at the same time it's more the developing brain from teenage years through age 25 that uh, are impacted in that way. And I have very personal experience in my own practice uh, and can vouch for that. And um, I dare say any physician would be able to. Um, youth have a more significant propensity towards dependence, about three times that of adults. The earlier you start, the more likely that would develop. There's an association with depression and anxiety and heavy use. We know from the motor vehicle experiences uh, in the literature and in other states that there's an increased risk of crashes and fatal crashes. And we know for adults that there could be impacts, again, on dependence, but also on economic productivity, uh, how they work at their job, how much motivation they have, um, and other social, psychosocial outcomes. And if pregnant women should use it, and unfortunately they do in Vermont, uh, it can be associated with a lower birth rate for the infant. Um, when we talk about prevention and substance misuse, our common uh, mantra these days is that we don't silo substances. Substance misuse prevention works across substances, and we don't need to necessarily design a specific intervention for every single thing that human beings can take into their bodies. Um, and we stand by that still. Um, it turns out well, let's say Vermont does decide to commercialize um, the sale of marijuana products. Um, we would state that there needs to be comprehensive and sustainable prevention efforts to protect youth. The evidence-based strategies that we use in the health department for prevention only work when they are comprehensive and sustained can't be a one-time affair. And right now, as you know, across the state, there's very little funding for prevention. There is some federal money for prevention. Uh, much of it is, uh, I'll use the word restricted or focused. Siloed. Uh, pardon? Siloed was the term Siloed you used could a few even minutes be used. ago. Yeah. Um, so this time, as we talk here, is a prime opportunity to begin to discuss how to focus funds from the state specifically on these activities. Um, commercializing marijuana usually implies um, that there will be an impact from industry that uh, will focus on perhaps vulnerable people. So the heaviest users or the youngest users. Um, they have a lot to lose over a long period of time. 
they can use over a long period of time. And those are the people we have the same public health concerns about. So as a physician and as a commissioner of health, I'm clearly focused on prevention. And my department is charged with protecting and promoting the health of all Vermonters. That's our mission statement. Um, prior to legalization, our health department obviously had a lot to say. Uh, about just the legalization issue and how that would impact our youth. Um, and I can say a lot of the same now with regard to uh, a legalized product but now having a regulated market. Thought I'd turn that off, sorry. Um, Yeah, no, so the main lesson that we've learned from states that have already been through what we're going through right now um, is that they would have loved to have prevention money up front. They felt that their prevention money came way too late. And we're not talking like, you know, just a little too late. It was a couple of years too late. Obviously, they did set up their structures to provide revenue that would then be dedicated towards prevention, um, but not having it at the outset uh, put them behind the eight ball uh, very, very quickly. And it takes a, a Department of Health and others who are partnering with the department a fair amount of time to set up these programs. It's not like you just snap your finger and all of a sudden you have a total prevention program operational. The counterparts we have in other states estimated the amount up front would be five to ten million dollars. So their advice obviously was to have some kind of funding up front built into the entire legislation and protect young brains when the market actually opens rather than after the fact when these young brains may have already been impacted. So I want you to keep that in mind. S-54, as it's currently um, structured, <coughs> does not include funding or requirements for prevention efforts. And I testified to that uh, in the Senate Judiciary Committee as well. The, um, the fact that the bill would move forward then with a commercial market that is aimed at Vermont's youth without any of the valuable protections can be provided is very concerning for me, especially when we have a good track record in prevention and know that the types of programming that we can develop and set up and that are evidence-based and that should be comprehensive and sustained, they actually work and the rate of use can decrease. So clearly I would be uh, offering my sage wisdom in saying that S-54 needs to include funding for evidence-based, comprehensive, and sustainable community prevention efforts. And I went so far in the Judiciary Committee, and I'll do it here as well, saying that it's not only unacceptable and irresponsible, but it's unconscionable to develop a legal marketplace for marijuana without establishing a dedicated revenue stream for education and prevention to protect public health and to protect public safety. I have a few other items I'd like to um, just sort of add into my talk here that are very um, specific and focused. Um, I know there's been some conversation about uh, modifying the bill in some way with regards to medical marijuana um, and making changes to perhaps the uh, indications or requirements that would be out there for using medical marijuana. And bottom line is um, there's <coughs> nothing in the medical literature regarding new conditions that are suddenly, you know, medical marijuana is the cure, is the treatment uh, beyond the conditions we already have, some of which I will add are not evidence-based. Uh, so I would certainly not think that there'd be any room for any other conditions that perhaps someone might be advocating for. Second thing has to do 
with um, edibles. The Education and Prevention Subcommittee was very specific and uh, direct regarding their lack of enthusiasm for regulating edibles. When you look at states like Colorado, where um, kids have gotten into trouble, uh, when you look at volume of emergency room visits for pediatric populations, um, there's some very recent literature I just read two weeks ago that further substantiates this. Um, there's uh, not an insignificant amount of visits to hospitals for uh, adverse events related to marijuana. And then within that group, there's a fairly significant group that are edibles and kid related. Um, so we obviously have a strong sentiment against edibles, period. The overall Marijuana Commission could not make a decision. Uh, it came down uh, as a really split vote. Uh, so the report reflected the fact that we weren't saying no to edibles, but we weren't saying yes to edibles either. It was really divided. Um, also, with regard to edibles, um, there's a clarification I should make with regarding to uh, food licensing. The Department of Health regulates uh, licenses, you know, food establishments, restaurants. Um, not included in something like that is actually selling marijuana products within those food establishments. It's envisioned, we would hope, that if edibles were on the market, they would continue to be sold in the dispensaries and that um, like CBD products, not like CBD products, which are kind of now everywhere you look in society, even though there's not a lot of evidence for their benefit. Um, but for the actual licensing of establishments to sell edibles, that's not the business that the Department of Health will be in or should be in. Um, and I just want to add that level of clarification. On topic? Yes. Um, so if someone was making edibles, would the health department have some oversight of the facility that's being used to manufacture um, those no. products at that point? No? No. Jim? I don't know. Maybe I misheard, but I thought we went to the medical facility and we went through the kitchen and they talked about being inspected and regulated said by the health department. They have invited the health department no. yeah. okay. and, been, right. and been told we don't regulate okay. these kind of facilities. Right. Okay. So why would you say that? That's not our business. It's a food production facility. And we don't actually inspect every food production facility. It's your license. We license, we license the restaurant. Sure. Hi, everyone. Sheila Livingston from the health department. Um, just to jump in here a little bit. So the health department is not, um, is looking to clarify. So right now, as envisioned in this bill and in front of you, um, edibles, if they are to be allowed, would be only sold through dispensaries. On top of that, the board, however it is, Define would then um, simply confer with the health department about what type of oversight and regulations would be appropriate if they are producing edibles, and that board would have to staff and oversee that and go and do those inspections themselves. So we would be happy to provide technical assistance with the food safety aspects of that and how they would implement it, but the health department and our licensing um, technicians would not be the ones going out and inspecting that. So we are looking to clarify that in the bill <coughs> as currently drafted. In what way? Um, so Michelle's not here, unfortunately, but I did actually talk to her about it a little bit before. Um, I'd have to Pull if, share if you'd like yes. to uh, not have to. <laughs> I mean, you can also stand. We don't mind having people look, look down at us. <laughs> yeah. um, so I would have to work with her. Um, with if, if the committee is interested, I would work with her to figure out the best way to crack that. Her 
the interpretation of the bill that's currently drafted is that indeed that is the case. Um, and that tax has actually, in Senate Finance, went in and made some similar clarifications around what is considered food and what is not considered food. Um, and that the Health Department is here to ask that we be able to offer that similar kind of clarification um, in relation to our licensing. I'd be happy to take a look at that. Okay, great. So you want you. to license? No. No, you we don't want to license. We do not want, the Health Department does not think legalization is a good idea. We do not want to do license. We would be happy to provide any regulatory agency with how to enforce food safety mm -hmm. regulation if they wanted to adopt them. Jim, did that answer all your questions? And now no. you had your hand up. Earlier. No, no, no. That, that, what, no, I have other questions, but we went over them. I'll go back. Um, so, um, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's, that's fine. No, it was, it was on topic. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just trying to stay on this topic. I'm not sure I totally agree with that answer, but that's okay. So we can have disagreements. Okay. Uh, JP? I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not clear on why. I've heard a couple few times that the Department of Health does not want to regulate this, but I'm, I'm not clear on why you don't. Sure, so it's not our area of expertise, right? Like we don't we don't have um, regulations or limits on how much THG and how to test that food and how to make sure that that is done safely. That's not something that we are able to do. We want to ensure we have seen issues with CBD products as they are currently being sold in establishments that we do license. And so we want to make very clear, again, I don't think this is think it's a clear in the intent that the edibles, if they are to be legalized, would only be sold out of dispensaries, but we want to make that crystal clear that if you have a license from us to sell food, that an edible product with THC in it is not considered food and that that's not to be sold in establishments with our license. Um, and again, there are standardized FDA food safety, preparation safety guidelines, and those can be implemented and monitored by any regulatory body that you know adopts them as rules. And we are happy to assist the cannabis, I can't remember what it's called, the cannabis board, um, with how to do that. Um, but our, we do not, or we don't want to, our staff going and, and doing those things. That's not what they're trained. So you're suggesting that you would be happy to share, for instance, the roughly 100 point inspection form that you use when you come to my commercial kitchen yes. yeah. and license my <laughs> you know kitchen well. and you know when you point out the fact that that floor tile is cracked and needs to be replaced and you know uh, this is you know an opportunity for a hazard here and and this needs to be fixed so you, you're suggesting that you would rather give that to another entity and have them do those inspections than to have you come into uh, a kitchen where uh, a cookie with cannabis infusion is being made. Correct. And have it be part of whatever other license that the board is having these places get. Yeah. So in the event that the Cannabis Control Board were to look at the landscape around Vermont and say, we really don't want to recreate the wheel here. We want the Department of Health to inspect the food safety aspect of it, and we'll leave the Agency of Agriculture in their testing lab or whoever it is that ends up doing the testing of the concentrate of, um, of cannabis. Um, would you be capable of doing that? Uh, so we would oppose that. We would also be, we are currently at 50% staff of what we're supposed to be according to FDA for restaurant and food license. That's factors. why I don't see you often. Correct. Fair. I'd like to be there more often. Um, and so we would need a significant amount of staff, and we would request a significant amount of staff to do that. So it might be prohibitive in terms of the cost. Other questions? Um, Hal and then Nelson. So Dr. Levine, I really appreciate your advocacy and your support um, for education prevention with regards to cannabis. Um, and you know, I, I, I also am concerned as well. Um, <clears throat> so say if um, the bill goes through uh, without any meaningful or sustainable 
um, education prevention uh, resources, and tomorrow the market opens. Um, what's it look like in three years for our young brains out there? Yeah, so we'd be really concerned about that. Um, about the only thing, I mean, there, I don't want to give you the idea there's no prevention activities going on right now. Need this five to ten million dollars. The scale and magnitude and sustained program we envision requires those resources. So yes, there'll be some messaging campaigns that youth will see on their own social media, um, which is fine. It's certainly not the makings of a comprehensive prevention program because messaging is sort of a necessary but never sufficient kind of ingredient. What it really requires is. Um, usually regional programs of prevention that are tailored to the communities in that specific region that involve a lot of community input, parental input, and uh, expert, if you will, input. Um, you've heard probably talk about things like the Iceland model since they were just visiting the State House last week. Uh, some models of that sort that go over, frankly, years to decades, but that still, when they begin, have a very comprehensive portfolio of prevention activities that involve the community level and the school level concurrent. Um, and that usually requires people who full-time work in those activities to carry out these programs. So I think it would be, um, It'd be very challenging to suddenly have cannabis on the market without, especially with the perception of harm data that I showed you, um, and expect that we wouldn't be behind the eight ball from the start, and perhaps for many years. Now, Seth Warren, Jim. Uh, I have a couple. One is when you talked about uh, not uh, inspecting health work. Who inspects the pharmacies and makes sure that the pharmacies are crossing the stuff in the state, or is it just they get the product from someone they sell? Um, probably. It's a little out of my scope, but but it's I can say that it's not apples and apples what you're talking about because we're talking about the actual drug being integrated into a food substance, as opposed to a vitamin being a gummy bear. Uh, we're talking about an actual uh, psychoactive drug in a food substance. Okay. And the other, the other question, I agree with you, but you've got to be out ahead of it. I thought we did a good job on teaching our young not to smoke. But as you see, there's always another side that's always trying to get out in front of this. Yes. Okay. So I think it has to be ongoing. It's not a, as you say, we need an initial front, but I think we can't drop the ball if we do that. I completely agree. So, the initial robust effort and then sustained effort. A little while ago, I think you were talking about your investigation with what other states were doing in terms of education yes. prevention. And the number five to ten million dollars came up. Was that specifically a Vermont number, or is that what some no, of these other states? That's were? what some of the other states were talking about. Okay, so we we perhaps could scale that to size because whichever states you were talking about were bigger than Vermont. Yeah, I like Washington and Colorado. Yeah, yeah, bigger yeah, than Vermont. I don't Seven think there are any bigger. that are smaller than Vermont. Yeah, right. So we could. I, I, that was just my thought. Can we scale that yeah. to a Vermont effort? Uh, some sort of per capita <laughs> adjustment. Yeah, I mean, we, we have scaled it, if you will, to a six to eight million dollar number. Well, because. Right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I'm, just, I'm, I'm thinking I, my, my good friends down in the Ways and Means Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're, so, the, so what they're you, going to think when they hear six to eight million dollars, everybody's five to ten. No, I, 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 I hear you. Find that. 
So, so when you're talking about like some of the school-based activities, uh, they usually require what's termed like a substance abuse professional in the school. Um, and we have that in about one third of Vermont schools now. Uh, so just the cost of that scaling up is real money uh, because that's two thirds of the, you know, the schools in Vermont. And this regional approach to uh, prevention that I've been discussing um, still requires um, the millions of dollars, whether you're a state that's shaped like Colorado or shaped like Vermont you still have regions that all have the unique flavors and need that kind of structural support um, to carry out the program. So it's not quite so easy to say we could scale it down. Um, I, I, both geographically. I understand that it's yeah. difficult to scale yeah. it down, but I'm also. So I understand where you're coming. Sure. Yeah. Well, we, we can't find 25,000 no. extra for anything. Right. Money doesn't go. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jim. Um, so I appreciate your um, advocacy, as was mentioned before, about wanting to do an education program. Can you give us some meat on the bones with that? I mean, what is it? I mean, six to eight million. I'm not going to help us all because we don't have six to eight million to put into this. Mm -hmm. um, I do agree it's got to be part and parcel to whatever we do, if we do anything. Even if we do nothing, it should be there. But so, we need some structure, you know. This is what it looks like. And ideally, you get this, but we could do a good effort with why. Uh, so that would be very helpful. The other question I have related to all that is, in the states that have gone uh, ahead of us that have gone to a retail market. Um, have there been any change in youth access that we can measure, or anybody that's measured? Maybe that's not possible. When you say youth access, meaning? Um, younger than 21. Younger than 21. Right. Uh, I'm not sure about the data on that. To be honest. Probably too early, yeah. but since we legalized it last July, have there been any change in Vermont um, on youth access? Yeah, or so youth, 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 I mean, it's still right. illegal in right. either case. Right, because youth can get a hold of things right. anyway. Right. So we're counting on the next survey to actually give us that data. For it, that and when are you doing that? that? <clears throat> this year, 2019. I, I just yeah. uh, no. I'm with some, you. Sometimes yeah. you know. No, you want data too. That's it, right. Having it, at, that. doing it at home, where <laughs> we sort of put it in this, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, yeah. But it, we could have made it worse, um, as opposed to a regulated retail market. But, I'm not yeah. saying we did. No, I, we could have. Yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from because at home, youth have access to whatever there is at home. That's right. So. Can't, can't argue against that. Okay, uh, so can't finally, compare finally, to the finally I, I, what I heard you say is you don't like edibles. Right. Okay. Um, and it was an education for me to go to uh, a dispensary yes. last week, week before. Uh, in that, uh, what hit home to me is there's a delay. So you might have a brownie you got it. Don't feel anything until you might have a second brownie. So that made me think, well, maybe. First problem was eating the whole brownie. <laughs> yes. Never maybe, eat a whole brownie. Maybe, it maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> on, on, on the other hand, what? you know, it's sort of like if I have a drink, I feel it, you know, pretty, quick. pretty quickly. Yeah. So I know enough maybe not to have that second drink. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I, so I am concerned about yeah. that. But on the other hand, uh, unless people around this room know things I don't know, I'm not. I'm a, I'm a little naive about some of this. Um, you smoke it, uh, uh, or you vape it, right? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's quicker it, than it's quicker. But 
I'm not sure that's the type of behavior we want to say, you know, vaping or smoking is okay. So you say we're, tar we're, we're focusing people on the more unhealthy ways to ingest the product yeah. because we're forbidding them from doing it. <coughs> I don't know. I'm just curious to your thoughts on that. Obviously, yeah. we've so, made a lot of progress on right. reducing smoking. We've still got a ways to go. No, but, so you're? Yeah. Um, so I'm just, I don't want to say, you know, so, it's so okay one, to smoke now. Uh, right. So the one point I, I, I'll start out by saying is we're talking about the concentration of THC in whatever root we're using and whatever product we're using. And THC is a psychoactive ingredient. And the cannabis of the 2000 teens, compared to 20 or more years before, is a whole different product. Okay. It is far more potent, so that no matter what root, uh, the potency factor is increased over what anybody might remember from the past years. So we should have the health department regulate that. Well, <laughs> we won't go there. While <laughs> you were inspecting the kitchen. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're not doing it now with the home growth. Uh, we regulate I, numbers I, of plants. I get off. Well, Do you have to just... I, no, I'm good with you. Um, so, um, but your truth. The reason I'm going to protect youth is because youth can more <coughs> readily pick up something that's edible, perhaps knowing what's in it or perhaps not knowing what's in it, and it packs a potent punch. And if you don't know on the first brownie because you didn't give it enough time and you're still hungry, that's why why not have a second one. It also looks so, like my problem at dinner is I eat my food very fast. Yes. I'm still hungry. Right. Yeah. So the other thing is, it's gotten to my brain that I'm really we would assume hungry. within the legislation, and some of it's been covered in prior legislation, there would be safeguards built in so that if edibles were permissible, they would not be child friendly, so to speak. So the types of products uh, like candy and you know, recognizable products that are the same in every way except they happen to have THC in it, um, we would presume that there would be restrictions and regulations regarding that, point of sale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and in the uh, document I referred to from my committee, we have a whole list of those kinds of safeguards. With regard to the meat on the bones in prevention programs, um, without again getting hugely into the weeds, we have messaging campaigns, we have school-based prevention activities, some of which involve the actual people who are connecting with students, uh, advising them, counseling them, but also responding to them as trusted uh, mentors, if you will, uh, when they have problems. And we've seen with the SAPs in the schools to date that those relationships actually form very nicely and uh, are worth expanding. Plus, there's curriculum in schools. Within the communities, models like the Iceland models do take time to develop, but they involve important ingredients. And these ingredients may sound intuitive, but they actually take time to develop. One of the ingredients is actually talking to the youth themselves and hearing about the things that they want to be doing or can't do because they're not available in their community. We talk about the so-called third space, which is the after-school uh, component, the most dangerous time being between 3 and 6 p.m., 3 and 7 p.m., depending on what hours you want to use, because they're not in school, they're not exactly with family and at home, uh, and whatever happens in that space happens. And some very productive and constructive things can happen in that space, and we are actually starting to fund uh, some of that in a very preliminary way across the state uh, to really make sure that, you know, it's not just sports either. Sports is a big component, but it's all kinds of other activities. Countries like Finland call them hobbies. Uh, in Iceland, they uh, have a lot of leadership activities that empower youth. They have a lot of activities that youth can become proficient at something and feel good and feel like they're a contributing part of their community. Um, Another important component is parental activation, if you will. Parents have to really buy into this as much as their kids and, and support their kids in these activities and in this kind of a structure. And then there's the community 
uh, activation piece that has to happen where communities actually all envision the kind of community they want to live in and that they want their kids to grow up in and provide the support for actually making that actualize uh, So there's a lot of uh, very, in, I would call it intense work, but uh, work that everybody actually wants to do and recognizes is, is good work to keep youth out of trouble, keep them uh, feeling um, empowered in many ways, having a voice, but also having them feel like they're a member of a community. Because the other part of our youth risk behavior survey data shows that Unfortunately, high levels of youth don't feel connected in their community, feel socially isolated, um, and that leads to depression, suicidal ideations, things of that sort. In addition to that, if you further look at it from a uh, whole population standpoint, there are segments of the population that have it even worse than what I've described. So if we look at socioeconomically disadvantaged people, if we look at LGBTQ community, we look at racial, uh, you pick your parameter, you, you will inevitably find that they score worse on some of these adverse circumstances that I've mentioned. So we have to be very focused sometimes in how we do our prevention because there's an actual part of our population that will benefit so much more than anyone else and we don't want them to be forgotten. So I got two hands, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have spent a great deal of time in my life working with young people, um, first as a teacher, uh, and as a coach, <coughs> and as a mom. Um, and I know that the most effective uh, approach to, uh, to keeping kids on healthy behaviors and on a healthy trajectory is the relationship that they have with an adult, a trusted adult in their life and is the combination of um, real accurate information that says this is not a healthy behavior and full and open access to a variety of things that are healthy. And that's where I fear we are going to fall on our faces because we don't do a good enough job. When I just, when I look at what has happened in my community in the last 10 years in terms of the narrowing of options for kids to be involved in after school activities. There's no longer an afternoon bus, so kids in a rural community, unless they have a mom or a dad who come down into town to pick them up, can't participate in the play. They can't do the after school club. They can't. You know, they can't go on the, uh, you know, the snowboarding trip or the ski trip that gets home at 5 o'clock. They can't participate in sports. Um, these are all really um, resource-intensive um, yep. supports that are really critical to keeping kids involved, connected, and active in ways that will be vastly more effective than simply having a substance abuse professional in every exactly. building saying, don't do it. So I want to work with mm -hmm. the Department of Health and, uh, and the administration to make sure that we're putting forward our best uh, mutual efforts at how we achieve the kind of substance abuse um, prevention push and pull that we need to. Um, unfortunately, you know, the frustrating thing is uh, we're referring to all of these model countries um, who have actually figured it out and know how to do it. And these are all the big bad socialist countries <laughs> that take all of your money away from you and thou shalt not because we're Americans and we do it better. Um, sorry to be uh, sorry to be glib about it, but um, but they're they're making an investment. They're making a conscious investment exactly. in their young people because they've seen the the ill effects of leaving kids to kind of float and test with whatever they have yeah. access to that looks like fun. How are we going to? What are what are you? proposing to show us as a citizen legislature that we can support in how we move us Good. along Good. that model. 
So, you know, I appreciate everything you just said. And when we talk about how to shave the five to ten million dollars down, it's really hard when you hear stuff like this because it takes resources. We actually have a country in the southwestern corner, southeastern corner, not a country, <laughs> in the southeastern corner of Vermont. It's called Deerfield Valley. Um, so when you talk about Finland, when you talk about Iceland, how did they start? They looked at their data, the kind of data we've been talking about, and said, we are alarmed at the rate of our kids using X, Y, and Z substances. Not only that, they're out to 4 in the morning in the case of Iceland, uh, because it's daylight there half the year at 4 in the morning, and they're just doing bad things at that time. And they learned that from their parents who did the same. We need to make a change in that. Um, so. Models like that began that way. Well, Deerfield Valley had the same beginning, too. They had an infusion of monies from the health department and elsewhere for a regional, as we call it, a regional prevention partnership, um, and invested it in much the same way that these other countries did, and had the exact same curve. Now, this is over 10 to 20 years. This isn't over three months to six months. But over 10 to 20 years, they have the same curve, except the numbers are a little different. Iceland and Finland have achieved much better numbers than we have in Vermont. But the fact is, uh, we have come down substantially. And we can show you this data. And it's very compelling data when you can say, if they can do it down there, why can't we do it elsewhere? And throughout the state, because of the opioid epidemic, we have coalitions developing on their own like the Chittenden County Opioid Alliance, Project Vision in Rutland, PITR in Newport now. I mean, I can go on and on. They're all over the state. Uh, and they're not all over the state, but they're growing in numbers. Uh, and they don't have this kind of money and this kind of vision right now. They have a vision for how they want their community to look, because they don't want needles on the street, and they don't want to have people who are succumbing to overdoses from opioids. Uh, so they have good reason to have their coalition drawn together. But they're at the point where they want prevention, too. And just like you're speaking, uh, it does cost resources. But if the evidence base behind it can be shown, and people are convinced, as I know they will be, that the programming we talk about works, it changes the equation the way I see it. Because you know we're dealing with opioids now. We're on the threshold of dealing with cannabis. We still have alcohol, which we should never forget about because it's still on number one. Cannabis. I have high schoolers. We're dealing with cannabis. Yes, and we're dealing it's with jewels here. and any cities. It's been here. <laughs> right. Before. So we're dealing with all these things, and you know, tomorrow we could be dealing with stimulant drugs. I mean, so it has to be a program that works for all the reasons you stated that engage youth and engage parents and communities in ways that will just know that the outcome is going to be better and they don't have to worry about the new kid on the block that's the drug of concern it's <laughs> any substance at all. So you helped me state that well, I appreciate it. We used a, a model for tobacco use many years ago um, to reduce youth rates of smoking and is it possible that some of the ingredients that went into that formula that seemed to work pretty well could be translated mm -hmm. into um, prevention programs for cannabis. Uh, I know that um, along with you know some print which really wasn't used that much but there were clever, inexpensive um, TV ads from OBX. Oh, yeah. um, grants were given to communities mm -hmm. where they mm -hmm. presented their ideas for their community to reduce cannabis use or tobacco at that time. And, and then you know people would review that and say, we're going to pick these. These are the best. And, and those communities would receive some funds from the health department. Mm -hmm. um, and you've even had youth come to the state capitol uh, who are in organized groups to help the adults 
help use campaign against right. the backer. Right. Yes. So all so, of that, some of that's happening and you don't know it. Right. Because again, it's on social media that the youth see and that you don't see. Mm -hmm. But if I had to tell you, well, I had to ask you, I, I, I should never put a legislator on the spot, but I'm going to. What do you think the most successful part of an anti-tobacco campaign in Vermont has been in terms of what was implemented? Was it the things you talked about, or is it something that I'm going to mention? Uh, probably something you're going to mention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so there's two things I'm going to mention, right? Because for tobacco, the CDC and other august bodies says there's a tripartite, a tripartite kind of uh, formula. Mm -hmm. One is messaging campaigns. The second is interfering with people's ability to smoke comfortably, in a sense. Uh, so laws that pass for secondhand smoke, mm -hmm. restricting where you can and yeah. can't smoke. Raising prices. All of that. And then the third part is taxation. Uh, and I know there's been some discussion about the level of taxation um, and trying to find that sweet spot where you can fund all these wonderful programs, uh, make some money perhaps as a state, but also where the black market or gray market or whatever you want to call it won't be as potent uh, an adversary, if you will. Um, so I know that there's been numbers thrown around in many circles, but certainly the commission, the marijuana commission, I believe recommended the 20% excise tax and the 6% sales tax, 26% tax, um, which is the number that does fund the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, so if we learn from big tobacco, we always say that alcohol, cannabis, you name the industry, they learn from big tobacco because they have a very strong playbook. Um, if we learn from our experience in combating big tobacco, it should be to realize that these taxation routes and these access routes are really prime areas to focus on. I worry that if your pack of American spirits had to go up against, you know, somebody's home grow yeah. that, that, that they were selling on the black market, that uh, our, <coughs> our tobacco tax revenue would plummet very quickly. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I think we need to, Find uh, obviously spot. the committee downstairs is going to do a lot of work on the taxation level, yeah. um, but, but one of the... Uh, one of the fundamental areas of focus, I think, uh, needs to be in how do we, in moving out of prohibition, how do we try to bring the black market, not snuff it out. I don't think we're going to snuff it out. I think we're going to have to figure out if we can bring it in. Um, and taxation rates going to have some influence on that. John and then Jim. Okay, so I have two questions. Uh, you know, I believe it's very important that prevention be looked at very carefully. Unfortunately, in this bill, um, the bill is currently drafted barely or doesn't pay for the Cannabis Control Board, let alone for a prevention matter, and, you know, methods or anything like that. Do you have any thoughts about how we can fund a prevention program, either through the budget, the general fund, or, or through a, a different mechanism, taxation mechanism, or licensing mechanism, um, so that we can put in place prevention mm -hmm. at the, the beginning, not halfway through the process. Right, early on. Yes. That's probably outside my scope of influence in state government. To, uh, as a health commissioner. But are there models out there? I mean, uh, taxation. Yeah, funding it through taxes. Taxation is the model, unfortunately. But did any state you know, have a tax system set up so that there was prevention right from the beginning? And what I heard you say is that did not happen. So that those models, mm -hmm. at least what other states have done today, mm -hmm. right. did not lead to a prevention. I, I do know that in the initial, um, this won't provide $5 million, but I know that in the initial licensing issues, that all happened up front. There's a fair amount of administrative stuff that has to happen up front before you start selling the product. Um, there is opportunity for some of those revenues to be utilized in new ways. So a lot of those revenues are supposed to go to pay for the administrative infrastructure that's required to run this operation from a state perspective. But one could 
actually divert it to this kind of activity, knowing that the state will still get what it needs um, back eventually over time if they don't get it the moment that it happens. Am I clear about that? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it would be good to, to hear, I, I mean, solutions for financing. Because I, I mean, at the end of the day, there's likely to be a lot of revenue um, through the retail sale of cannabis. So how can we get to the point that we can have prevention at the front end and, and not in the middle or at the back end? I mean, For instance, the board is set up, um, and S54 contemplates um, borrowing against anticipated receipts in order to fund the activities mm -hmm. of setting up the regulatory structure with the board, their board, board salaries, mm -hmm. their executive director, any contracting they might need to do for technical expertise <coughs> in how to regulate this very new industry. Um, conceivably, within the Agency of Human Services, you could, uh, you could propose a, a similar structure that would maybe at least get the groundwork, the network of uh, these regional programs <coughs> that, you, uh, that you think will be very valuable in youth prevention um, and, you know, I mean, I heard Secretary Gobey at the press conference the other day say very clearly, there's no money to do this unless we have tax and regulate. So how can we come together, you know, endorse a plan and a concept and put it into, into motion in the same, uh, you know. Same breath. Yeah. I, I do want to stress, I think that this, other states have really seen this thing of they're playing catch up and that, that's a huge problem. But I think what you hopefully what you've heard from the commissioner is the, the model that we can cite here in Vermont, the Deerfield Bad model. That is a decades long program. What we're here saying is exactly what the chair said, which that this needs to be for substance misuse prevention across the board, doesn't have to be substance specific, it has to be sustained so that we can do these comprehensive programs. In order to do that, what, what we're saying is we need a dedicated revenue stream that is going to continue to come in. That's not the federal grants that come and go and up and down and have all these strings attached to them. And that when we look at S54 as it's currently drafted, it does not have any language saying that any of that tax revenue, and like you said, there will be tax revenue, will go to that long term. And that, as a public health model, is the most important thing that we can tell you. We can go on and on about all the different ways in which we could do prevention, et cetera, et cetera, but none of it matters unless it is funded. And right now in this 54, it's not funded, and there's no way to guarantee that that funding will go to prevention work. And that, that is, as, as a public health agency, that is the most concerning piece. Well, I, I think I want to shift to the second question, which goes to the taxation issue. Um, I, I know high taxes tend to lead to less consumption uh, of various products. Um, but if you look at the Senate, and I can't take this insight as my own, but if you look at the um, Senate fiscal note, uh, you actually see revenue increasing, uh, even though we're taxing marijuana, because usage is increasing, but the price is dropping. So is the current taxation model that's proposed in S54 the correct taxation model? Which is 16? Yeah, 16 plus 2% option tax. That's not what we call 0 plus 2016. I think even if you went up to 21, you're going to see the same results. I, I mean, because the price the price of the pro product is going to be dropping dramatically. Right. So, so you're right. I know that in other states, you're correct. I think what's happened is the price has gone down, the revenues have still gone up. Um, and I mean, I, I think one, one of the things that we're doing right now uh, that the, the House has done and so is looking at is the tax on e-cigarettes um, and what level that would be appropriate at. Um, and I, I don't, I mean, we don't have an exact answer for you on that, but that, that might need to be adjusted. I think the chair's point with the black market is you're not going to know, I mean, you know that the black market has not been eliminated in any way in California. Like, it's thriving in California, <laughs> or gray market, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think that that, you know, that's definitely a piece that that this committee and that the legislature should look at. But as in terms of excise taxes, like the commissioner said, you're looking at them to drive 
the price up to the point where somebody, some kid is not going to be able to afford or not going to want to afford um, to start. So that's, and, and that people are going to want to use less. So yes, that is a public health tool that would, we can't, I'm not sure we are equipped right now to tell you no. a tax rate that would work because I'm not sure we know what the prices are going to be. But I think we showed you when I came in here about the e-cigs, uh, a graph that shows that each time a new tax was placed on tobacco products, there was a subsequent fall in adult and youth usage. Uh, they're quite nicely correlated. So higher taxes do have the impact we want. All we can tell you is from a public health standpoint, using public health data, you keep increasing the tax you keep decreasing the uh, number of individuals. So um, sort of going back to my first question, um, and, and maybe I just missed this in re reviewing the Governor's Advisory Commission um, report on marijuana, but how was the Governor going to fund prevention in his recommendations from the beginning? Where was that money coming from? I, totally speak for him, but I don't believe he actually spoke to them. So he didn't have a solution either. He only spoke to the issues of prevention and driver impairment, needing to be components of the legislation that came out. I don't believe he spoke to what he was saying. Okay, thank you. Jim? Can I dare go back to an issue <laughs> before that we probably can I just ask Warren first? Did you have a question on this topic? Yeah, I wanted to um, Can we comment just jump on the to exchange Warren between first? John and the doctor. Um, okay. at, you know, tobacco is very different than cannabis in that we have a thriving black market for <laughs> cannabis. We don't have a thriving black market for tobacco unless you want to drive to the Aquasasne Mohawk mm -hmm. Reservation and mm -hmm. get it real cheap. Um, so when, when you raise the tax on tobacco, it's no surprise that consumption drops. But if we raise the tax on cannabis past some point, the black market simply thrives. So it, it's, it's just very different in that, in that regard. I think you can't make a really strong correlation between the two because it's so different. In the, I understand where you're coming from, but I would ask that that doesn't necessarily dictate that we start too low. No. <laughs> no. It may not be as high as envisioned, but should not be so low that uh, you've taken care of the black market, but usage yeah. is just widespread and people are addicted and never going to stop using it. Yeah. Well, the sweet spot is what's hard to find. Mm. Yes. A little bit of a blind spot at this moment. Right. It is. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. building the plane while flying it. Um, so, Jim and then Marsha, and then, did I see a hand over here somewhere, Bob? Jim? So, two issues. Initially, you mentioned um, age, and you said the impact it was having on a developing brain at age 25. Are you suggesting the age be 25? Oh, if I was going to come out with a, a naive but informed for public day. health yeah. uh, You're king for the day. Member, then yeah. yes. You would. But, but we understand that. It's 21. It's 21. Okay. So, right. so my second question is, and maybe you folks know something that you can read into this that I can't, but food manufacturing facilities are clearly under the purview of the health department. And food manufacturers includes bakeries. So it begs the question, why aren't you inspecting them or licensing them? I mean, the only exemption is maple. We did, yes, well, and we didn't want you, you know, adding a license fee to, uh, you know, all of our uh, sugar shacks, but evidently. But I, I mean, it's clear. There's no exemption. Because they would if tell you those open water. rafters are going to drop something yeah. into your. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm sorry. I just can't. I can't let go. I, yeah. It's now before me. So. Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. This is a, um, you. This committee is contemplating an entirely new market. So we. So the FDA. I want to go back to your question a little bit. 
the FDA regulates drugs. So they inspect the drug manufacturers, they inspect the drug, we don't do that. The health department is not involved in inspecting drugs. We don't do any of that work, um, and that's not something that we can say, oh yeah, that's safe for human consumption. We don't want to be I, in I, that I business, understand even your a little bit. But, mm -hmm. um, so and that's not, understand the statute. There's yeah, no yeah, way. well we are asking for the statute, this new statute to, to be, be clear that that's not part of what we do. That's what we're at. Or clear that it is part of the issue. Show me the money. We can barely visit the chairs. I'm the schedule that it's supposed to be. Oh, don't worry. I see you walking around. I'm not asking. She's not sad about that. It's fine. Gives a fair amount of anxiety when when I get the text message from my employees that say, the health inspector is here today, and I say, Oh, good. I hope you were ready. <laughs> um, Jim, does that answer your question for the moment? I will mean, we'll, we'll let them to talk about it. <laughs> you'll, I, you'll come no, around. I'm sorry. To it. I just, you know, when I yeah, put it up, yeah. there's no reason. I've got a cue going, but Rob, is it on this topic? Uh, yeah, sort of, I think. I know it is. <laughs> Keep it on this topic, and then we're going to go to Marsha. No, I just want to talk bottom. about your place. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is, is part of the issue the fact that um, you, you inspecting there would be there in an official capacity, and doesn't that, don't you run afoul of some federal issues as far as, you know, it, it, it is condoned at the federal level parts of it, and doesn't that put you in state employees in a, in a kind of a tough position? Yeah, that's all. I, I, we would have to have our lawyers like yeah. fully vet mm -hmm. that because right now we're operating under the hope that we would be exempted. Um, that would be a, a, a thing to investigate. I think the other... Um, we can get, yeah, we can, we can get we'll more legal out of that. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to throw them a lifeline. <laughs> I don't care, but we'll take it. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> this should be a collaborative relationship with you. Marsha? I know. Yes. I'm sorry. Rob's. Rob's. Sorry. Just yapping. Okay. Thank you, Madam. Marsha, you have a question? Yeah. Well, uh, question, comment. Um, oh. <laughs> Ta da! Way to make an entrance. <laughs> no, right. So, getting back to the tax issue, uh, in the mid 1990s, uh, Vermont dropped its, or increased rather, its um, tax on spirits by quite a lot, up to a 25% retail tax. And the sales dropped to less than half of what they had been before and everyone went right next door to New Hampshire. So, you know, people find alternate markets and some of these products where they can get the same thing for a lesser price. But I understand where you're coming from on the tobacco. That did work well every time the price went up, you would get people to, to quit. Now, if you could just do that to New Hampshire as well, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. my kids. Yeah. And go right across the border. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and frankly, you know, we worried about that with the e-cigarette issue um, because we have, um, you know, one of the pieces of legislation you're you're entertaining is the Tobacco 21, and New York just uh, did that yesterday, um, and the governor will sign it because. The governor proposed it in the first place. And the legislature said, yes, yeah, so I'm sure it was signed. Massachusetts has already done that. New Hampshire doesn't show any signs of doing that. But again, the case we made was that only 1% to 2% of sales of these tobacco products are going to 18 to 20 year olds. So it's not going to decimate a border merchant by not selling cigarettes to 18 to 20 year olds in terms of they've lost all their business to New Hampshire because. That's a very small piece of the marketplace. But understand your concern. Okay. Thank you. Bob? 
it would be interesting when all the brownies and cookies come up with salmonella because the eggs were bad and somebody says who was looking down that barrel. But the, more to my original point, I find it to be sad that we're looking at trying to find a funding source for education and prevention for a problem that the Attorney General just filled us in this morning is is and has been existing for a long time. So at this point, the horse is out of the barn. We're running across the field with the saddle trying to get a free ride. It's just really sort of right. weird. It is. That's why it takes a decade to show yeah. a difference. But again, if I can do a parallel to the opioid crisis, we have an entire generation of people that are afflicted, and we're dealing with that. And we've got robust treatment and recovery systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got harm reduction strategies, you name it. Uh, we now are turning our attention towards we don't want the next generation. Um, so as a society, that's sort of the kind of things that are harder to do, but the things that we have to do, uh, otherwise no, the problems perpetuate themselves. Point goes more to the chair's conversation about doing things that need to be done rather than waiting yeah. until they should have been done. Exactly. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Levine? Or do you have anything else that you would like to leave us with? No, I think we've covered pretty much everything. I will say the Senate Health and Welfare Committee did ask the same question. Um, but then they tried to answer it themselves. <laughs> they let me off the hook a lot easier, but they tried to answer it themselves. Uh, and, and know how challenging it could be, but at the same time, did feel sort of, I think, I mean, they are the health committee, so that's part of it, but they really felt a commitment towards you know, pursuing this further, uh, because they agreed it couldn't be ignored. And I think my point to you today is just that, that to have a bill that doesn't even think about it or talk about it, you know, isn't explicit about the word even, um, just doesn't seem a responsible thing to do. So in the few years that I've been in this building working on really earnest, really life or death, you know, access to health care and, um, and health, um, and watching, watching really good policy move into the juggernaut of yeah. the money committee and uh, and go up onto the wall and spend the rest of the biennium there. Uh, there's only, there's two components that have the greatest chance of getting a default yes on any initiative. And I know that you know what these components are, but I'm just gonna say it for the benefit of yeah. the committee and the folks around the room. It has to be in the governor's budget in January and it has to have the strong support of the policy committee. And that's the only, yeah. that is the only kind of program that gets a default yes to the 11 members around the table in the appropriations committee room. And so my hope is, you know, I think, I think you're sensing that we have a lot of interest in supporting mm -hmm. uh, what looks like an appropriate um, youth prevention and public health outreach program. So we've got our yes. We appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. Thanks for being here.